G'day and welcome back to my channel. Now, in my last video, which was the workbench and new kits, where I looked at everything that I'm working on and the new kits that I bought, this was one of the new kits. And a number of you expressed an interest seeing what's inside this box because, like me, you'd really never heard of MHA, right? Or IMHA. I don't know how to pronounce it, right? We'll just say MHA because it kind of sounds nice. And I must say, I was taken by surprise when I saw this in the. Um, at the big hobby show, especially as they're only asking one and a half shekels for it. So I was quite amazed that you could get a 170 second scale, which is quite big for ships, uh, Viking ship, and it only cost one and a half shekels. How about that? Anyhow, without further ado, I think we should look inside of this box and I've also done some research on MHA, so we'll talk about that. Okay, roll the music. <music> Now, I couldn't find much information on the internet about MHA, but Scalemates list it as a company that started in um, Great Britain or England, um, 1982 to 2017. So they'd been around for a while in the last century, and, you know, well, basically half the last century, half of this century have been their life. But they don't seem to be present now, but you can buy the kits because if you click on the homepage button in Scalemates, it brings up this thing, Backman, right, Europe, okay, PLC, whatever that stands for, you know, Plastic Limited Company, I don't know. And they have MH kits listed. And there's about, well, about four dozen of them, yeah. Uh, it's, they're sort of all the same thing, like all their trucks are bed for trucks, and their aircraft is only really sort of a few different kinds. And yeah, I'll, I'll show you, you know, we go through because I've already alpha sorted this. So you get a few unusual sort of aircraft in 172nd. They're kind of nice, they're kind of different. Um, and as I said, the trucks are all Bedford versions thereof, and they're all in 124, sort of an unusual scale, but there you go. Then again, variations on um, certain kinds of aircraft. All right, 172nd seems to be the scale there. Uh, Viking Warriors, this is um, really of interest to me. So let's uh, let's alpha sort this again. It's forgotten it. Alpha sort, yes, goodness me. And waiting, waiting, waiting. Bloody internet, bloody internet. All right, here we go. Uh, alpha sort, okay. Now, yeah, look, they do one of these um, A7V tanks, but only 172nd. But that'd still be a fair size. They do one of those. Then they sort of do things in pairs. They'll do, you know, lots of figures. And they'll do both 135th and 172nd. And so, you know, there it all is. And there's all those trucks, as we're saying. There's lots of old World War One sort of stuff in both 172nd and 135th. So that's kind of their genre. So they sort of do a lot of that thing. Uh, they've got, you know unusual eclectic sort of stuff but working your way down i'm interested in this whole section viking there's my ship okay the viking ship and lo and behold they make the oarsman for it in 172nd wouldn't that be interesting so that's always a, a thing with a you know any of these sort of things in the ancient ships because it's basically open and you see the crew the crew is fundamental to the workings of the ship the, um, the model often looks better if you can put the oarsman in. So there we go, that is an option. And there's also some standing figures and a few other things. So that might be worth the whole seven pounds they're asking. You know, by the time it gets to Australia, I'm going to probably pay two or three shekels for that. But you know, twice the price I paid for the kit. But it might be something nice to have to make it, um, you know, much more visually interesting. They also do some warriors in 132nd and 172nd. So there you go. That's about all I know about MH. So worth looking up. This is Backman with two N's, .co.ua. And it, the back is like Johann Sebastian, right? B-A-C-H-M-A-N-N. -N. I'll put a link here somewhere, right? So if you sort of want to have a poke around and have a look what they've got, it's well worth a look. Back to the kit. Okay. They call this a Gokstart, and I really don't know what the reference is there. I sort of haven't been able to figure that one out. If you know, if you know why they've sort of said Gokstart, is, is that a place or is that a type or is that the, the person that sort of had this boat? I don't know. I mean, my entire Viking knowledge is, is only gleaned from watching, um, you know, Ragnarok book on the TV series Vikings. That's it. Oh, and the old Tony Curtis movie. Remember that? Which I think also was called The Vikings. And that's about all I know. Oh, I did have an Icelandic sweater once, one of those really furry ones, because... 
My dad had a pen pal in Iceland. But I digress. All right, so he says it's 9th century, so that's um, just before their sort of heyday of their long boats, because it's more into later on and then into the 11th century is where all the invasions happened and the big expansion, as far as I remember. As far as I remember from my uh, Ragnar Roth book. <laughs> Actually, no, I did do a bit of research, I have. Anyhow, let's um, let's have a look. Well, yep, uh, oarsmen available separately. There you go. All you've got to do is read the box, and it'll tell you. And it actually tells you here, 72nd scale model of mid-19th century ocean-going Viking ship, capable of raids on Britain and elsewhere. So it was capable of it. Whether it did it or not, we don't know, but it was capable Okay, oars were used mainly inshore, 64 shields, 32 oars included, blah, 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 blah. Um, the deck can be removed to reveal an accurate representation of a voice. Actually, the interior is interesting. I'll get into that now. And it is 12 and 3 quarter inches long. That extra 3 quarters of an inch, ladies, it's always worth that little bit more. Yep, yep, yep. So, um, yep, stand uh, can be displayed on the stand included. Further description on the rear of the box. Oh, look at all this. I don't usually sort of print the rear, but there you go. Here's, um, here's a whole whole suite. I should have read that first. <laughs> that could have sounded like I knew what I was talking about. All right, well, there's a whole lot of stuff there. Um, if you want to get this kit, you can learn all about it. And they're showing that complete range. So there you go. That is terrific. All right, uh, well, let, let's get into this thing. Upside down, Miss Pat. Upside down. Everything's upside down this day. Hurry up. <laughs> Australian viewers will get that reference. Yes, Miss Pat. All right, box open. And look, there's even more. Oh, it'd help if I actually... I haven't looked at this since the um, QMHE Expo. Look at this, they, they show all these things aside here. So all of that was there to let me know. And basically, if you Google MHA, you'll, you'll get a couple of distributors. In fact, there's even a distributor in Australia. So they might have those Viking oarsmen and I might be able to get them for a better price. Although, you know, in Australia it would be more expensive. It's usually cheaper to buy stuff overseas. Okay, so um, we'll do the instructions and look at the parts at the same time, which is my want. So we'll go over that in a sec. We'll just have a quick look at the parts. Now, the sail, it's, um, well, it's thin. It's thin, uh, but it won't it'll only look like a big billowed sail and I'd probably rather um, I mean if you're going to have the oarsmen in there or, or rowing then this would be furled so you know um, you wouldn't have the sail fully out unless it was you know sailing along in which case you know or under sail in which case your oarsmen wouldn't really be needed unless they use both propulsion at the same time not sure. so although that that would probably be okay you get away with it as long as you want the thing to look like it's moving but it would certainly need a flat coat of paint. It's nice and thin, but it's going to look like a plastic sail because it doesn't have any weight to it. It can't be crumpled. So I'll put that aside. But, you know, that's that's not unusual. It's very rare anybody makes a sail that's half usable. Now look at these parts. The clinker planks are beautifully represented there. And they continue all the way through. It's very clean. It's very nice moulding, you know. Very nicely done. So that looks good. And if we have a look at the inside, huh, lo and behold, I mean, normally you just get nothing on the inside. They're covered up with a deck. That's it. As they say, they have represented that entire interior. So you've got the clinker planks again showing from the inside, and you've got the frames here. Now, if you have a look at the instructions, when you build it up, I mean, you're putting in this funny little thing first, okay, which sort of thing. Well, what's that all about? You know, but it makes sense later because you build up all the pieces, all the little pieces across. Uh, so it would be very similar to the real construction. At least that is what they're trying to say. So here it is here. You see that's built all that up over the top. The um, And this is sort of different. I've never seen this before unless they, they have done their research and they know this is exactly how things get put together. That's where they ship the oars to. I basically know that. But this is a great big chunky piece here, isn't it? So, um, yeah. I'd say these guys have done some research and this is exactly how it all goes together. 
I mean, why would they bother going and doing it this way unless they had some reason for it? That'd be my understanding. If you know more about Viking ships, let me know. But this is looking very clever or interesting. Because normally you get these things just all flat. You know, they do it like European boat, totally flat, shove a mast in, that's it. Yeah, okay, we'll call that a Viking boat. But no, these guys have gone to a lot of trouble to produce all that. So let's have a look. Uh, we've obviously got the mast here. And Viking ships don't usually have a bowsprit. So it's just one mast and one yard. That's it. That's all you get. And you've got a couple of extenders here, I would say. Uh, we'll check that. But do they do extenders? Is that what it's all about? Looking through the instructions here, and there's a ton of information. I, I won't read everything, but they give you uh, lots of tips and uh, options of how you should do things and, and exactly how the construction was. It's very good. Now, these two funny little guys here that, to me, look like you'd put stud sails on, you know, in, in sort of the ships that I sort of used to from the 17th, 18th century, you know, the French and, and uh, English ships. But no, here, what you do is those are used when you are tacking and because they don't really have much in the way of running rigging. This is the thing, there's there's very little running rigging in it. It's why they only supply you with, with brown rigging cord, right? And they go into great depths to explain all about the rigging and how it, how it works. So they, there is running rigging, but it's very different to what I'm used to. To hold the ship to tack, right? And if you don't know what tacking is, ships can go with the wind, but they actually go faster if you bring the sail around, tack it, right? And you run the air across it. Because if you imagine the sail is like the aeroplane wing, like the foil of an aeroplane wing, actually when the wind rushes across it, what happens then is you get negative pressure on the front. So strangely, wind going sideways over a sail doesn't blow the ship sideways, right? does push against the hull, but it doesn't blow the, the ship so much as the sail actually works like a wing. Negative pressure on the front means the sail is dragged forward and drags the ship with it. Isn't that interesting? That's something I've only really learnt recently. I mean, I've been around ships all my life, but what was explained to me, the reason that tacking works is because of the aerofoil shape of the sail. So what they do here is they're taking that little beam and they are locking it. They actually lock it into a point here on the side of the hull and then they lash it to a part of the deck and also to the bottom of the sail. Well, we would normally have a sheet line that would be considered a sheet line there and we'd pull it, you know, and we'd also be having um, basically braces back here which would pull in position. They sort of have those, but they're not what the tacking's all about. The tacking is actually held in place due to these lines. So isn't that very interesting? These two little spars here, they are used to hold the sail in a tack position. So that's something I didn't know. And it's, um, this kit is actually got so much in it that really helps you out. As I said, it goes on and on and on, all about the standing rigging, all about their running rigging, but it's very different to what I'm used to. So it explains it all. And even here where it's showing you where things are tied off, it's explaining in detail. So that, um, that is quite clever. And as far as I can see, there are no real blocks and sort of, you know, pulleys as you would do. There's no sort of a dead eyes or anything. There's none of that stuff that I'm used to. They're actually tying ropes into the ribs of the ship. Uh, so it's, it's very unusual. It's going to take a bit more investigation. But luckily, these guys give you that whole blurb. So they're really helping you out in how to rig your ship. Now, these are the little deck pieces and they sort of... They overlap and, and click together like that. And this is what we saw over here. Once you've got the hull halves together, which are showing all the ribs, then these little deck pieces go in and that all click together and form your deck, which is rather, rather clever. And I think they, they've made it so you don't have to glue them in. You could leave it and pull them out later if you want to show the deck. There's, oh, we've got some cleats for rigging. That's interesting. So there are cleats. Okay, cleats normally mean it's something that you wrap the rope around and pull tight. Okay, very much like belay pins. Interestingly, belay pins and that whole concept didn't really come into Europe until nearly the 18th century, really. A lot of people try to put it in 15th and 16th and 17th century kits and they, you know, they basically add them on. They put belay rails and drill all the holes and put the pins in. They didn't really exist. They weren't a thing. This is the thing. At that point, with um, those ships, like the, the St. Louis that I'm building, they actually just tied off against the rails or they had a, a point, you know, on basically a cleat on the side of the hull or on the mast and you'd tie off against a cleat. An actual belay rail with pins that went in to hold the rope, that whole system 
didn't really exist. It only came in maybe the late 16th century, sometime in the 17th century, and it really wasn't prevalent until the 18th century. So at least that's the research that I found. So that was interesting. As in the case for lots we do in modelling, a lot of the replicas have totally messed things up and, and been accepted as that's how it was, whereas the replicas, they've made mistakes or they've modernised something and the actual subject was nothing like it. Interesting part here, it's about the only one that's got any detail here because it's, it's fairly devoid of detail. This is, um, this is a ladder, by the looks of things. This is a ladder you put up against the um, you know, gangplank, if you like, and you put it against the uh, shore on the ship, and that's how you get aboard. So that's a nice little piece if you're doing a diorama. These are bits of the stand. Uh, the anchor, there's not much to it. I mean, you probably could kind of you know, do a little bit of adding on to scratch detail there, because it should have some cord bindings on it and a few things like that. There's um, quite a bit of writing about it. The anchor can be placed loose in the ship at the front, or bow, right? And you may wish to add some thread to the anchor to make it look like rope. Yeah, so um, that's exactly what I would do. I'd do some binding on it because they would be, I don't know if it's all wood or that piece is stone. I need to do some research there, but, but often to make it heavy, I mean, you don't want to make it all wood because it'll just float. So um, this would either have to be metal or stone. So, and then it would be, you know, it could, it could have been hot forged and then the, um, the wooden, a wooden stake shoved into it and then as the metal dries or the metal cools right it then shrink wraps around the um the wood and they often did that so that's that was a trick to basically join they used to do that sort of thing with hammers is heat up the hammer head slide it over the um the um handle right and then as the hammer head cooled it would jam hard against that handle because obviously as metal cools it shrinks so there you go, a bit of metallurgy here in Harry's video, trying to sound like he knows something about the world. Um, these are your rudder. So um, I'm not really showing you, it would obviously go up to the back here. Whether they had two, like in the ancient galleys, or just one, I'm not sure. We're only getting indication of doing one, and they don't really, oh, here it is. They show it here, so there's only one. So I imagine that's sort of the thing that you depending whether you're sailing, you know, with the wind to the port or the starboard, depending what your tack is, then it would be put on either side to help with steering. Again, we get some nice detail here about lashing the collar to the yard arm. So that's good. I mean, often in these kits, they kind of just stick the uh, the yard to the um, the mast, right? Yeah. Um, no. Uh, mistake, though, I'm calling it a yard arm because yard arms are those things that stick out on either side. It's a yard. But it's a common mistake, common mistake I'd made for many years for someone to point it out to me because, you know, we always cloak said, you know, hang him from the yard arm. You know, we'd always assume that was the yard. But no, the yard arm is an extra bit of wood when you are running stud sails on the other side. So another fun fact. So that's quite good. Basically, giving you some clear ideas there on how to attach that so it'll look a little more realistic. Um, telling you here, lash it around several times in the central point, poke it through the hole. There you go. Yes. Very good, getting instructions on poking through holes. Now this is interesting. Here they've got the shields on, right? But they say, uh, if you're using the shields, then you can't have the oars. Because the oars in this particular one, unlike sort of the um, the other boats, well, you know, the, the European boats that I know, the oars go along the top and there's a little, you know, a little seesaw thing for the oars. I forget what that's called. It's um, you know, the pivot point. Um, it's got a name on my mind getting old. Anyhow, um, your oars don't go over the top, and I've seen this so many times, people with the oars over the top, but no, they're saying the oars go through holes here in the side of the hull. So if you've got shields all down the side, well, you won't be rowing. Interesting. So they're saying if you've got shields on it, then you've got to have your sail out, and it's a, basically the ship is going to be under sail power. So I wonder what they did on a big journey where they'd have to use both rowing and sailing. So, um, who knows? I mean, maybe they then had to bring all the shields inboard and put them, you know, strap them to their backs or put them on the deck somewhere. Don't know. That's it's interesting stuff. It This leads me into having to do more research, which is rather good. It's got me thinking. So although the kit's sort of basic, the information provided and the, um, the detail here in the construction sort of makes up for its simplicity. It, it gives you well, it gives you a lot to do, and I like that. So, you know, you might say, oh, that's a bit of a shake and bake kit. Well, probably. But um, I reckon there's a bit of fiddling to do. It's nice and clean. Oh, we've got one broken oar there. One broken oar, though. That should be... Oh, there's another one. So those two are going to need to be fixed. But luckily, 
they're hanging on there, hanging on for uh, grim life. So I should be able to sort of put some uh, some glue on those before I pack this up and um, straighten them up. There was no bag when I got this. I don't know if they're originally bagged or not. The shields are gripped, so you don't have individual shields. And there's nothing much to them except a bit of sort of pretend wood sort of planking there. So they, you know, they're bashed together from, from basically pieces of wood. And that's probably how they were. Well, they were made like that. They were made like that. So if you wanted to go to more detail with them, you would paint, you know, the kind of designs that they had. So you could you could have a lot of fun with that. Uh, what are these? These look like cleats. Oh, they're actually the plugs, I think. I think they're all the plugs because you can plug up. You could have no shields, a sail, and then you plug up all the holes for the oars. They actually give you quite a few options how you put it together. And here's this terrific centerpiece. That's um, very nice. This all lends to wood effects, of course. So I will be using my um, Life Color liquid pigments and have a lot of fun sort of doing some wood effects on this. And this is your optional masthead, which is, you know, sort of a, a unicorn type figure or it's some sort of armored sort of um, horse. So that's um, it's nice as it is. It's got a bit of detail. You could probably do a bit more 3D rounding on it. But, um, that's quite good. Or they give the option, if you're just making this as a trading vessel, to cut that off. So there you go. And they don't really have a big fish tail at the end there. It's, um, it's just a basic sort of tail on it. The plastic is quite firm. It's quite firm. It, it's not super bendy, which will be great for the mast and the yard. Uh, they'll, um, they'll be quite supportive and quite strong. But yeah, it's going to be a very firm kit once you put it together. So there you go. There's really not a hell of a lot to this kit in parts. There's not a lot of parts. But I think the fun is that there's lots of options. Uh, the decisions that you need to make sort of lead you into doing some research. So as the kind of kit that I like that's fully engaging, this is the thing I'd spend quite a lot of time sort of really researching what one do I want, how do I want it displayed, you know, how I'm going to do it, do I want the oarsman in there. So um, for that point of view, it's, it's, it's super value for money to get you started onto building something that's going to turn into a Viking ship. So there you have it. That is a look, as requested, of this MH Gokstad 9th century Viking ship. So I know it'll get at least two views, because the two of you that asked for it. I hope you enjoyed this video. I, look, I hope you other guys kind of stick in there and watch it. It's, a, it's an interesting kit from a boutique maker that, you know, sort of is apparently not around anymore. So that means these kits will probably appreciate. I mean, if you hung on to something like this and, you know, stashed it, well, it might be worth quite a few dollars down the track out of sheer fact that it's rare and it's an interesting kit. And there's a lot of engineering in this one. Not a super lot of detail. The, the clinker planking's good, the construction of the hull's good. But then again, these sort of ships are fairly basic in their sort of details. There you go. Certainly be replacing the sail with a cloth one because, yeah, that plastic one doesn't cut it for me. But I'm very interested in the whole rigging because it, it is so different and it's the first time I've had Viking ship rigging explained to me. I have built tiny little Viking ships before and, you know, you just rigged them up however they said in the instructions, which was basically the kind of rigging in much more modern sailing ships, or more modern, you know, 17th, 18th century ones. But this is the first time I've seen someone, looks like they've done their research and they've said, look, it actually should be this way. And that little beam, that little rod, you know, that holds the ship sail in attack. Great. It's really good stuff. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. It's just a short video to sort of have a quick look at that kit and a bit of history of Emma. I'll get on with the other builds in the next few videos which will be coming up after this weekend. So look, if you enjoyed this video, as always, hit like, subscribe so you can see stuff on my channel, uh, comment, just be nice about it. And you can always join my Patreons or my YouTube members to see the videos early, advert free and get a bit more behind the scenes sort of action when I actually post things about Bass the Cat. Okay, that's it. That's all I've got to say. It's goodbye from Australia and it's Huru from Harry Houdini. <laughs>